Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Hope you're having a good day. It's Saturday, the 12th of September. And, uh, you know, we are doing our live Q&A session. I will riff for a few minutes while people join uh, and uh, start off with a question that was put in for my Saturday session to start us off. But the real meat of this will be live Q&A. So go ahead and put your question in the comments. Uh, I will do my best to get to all of them. So far, knock on wood, uh, we've been doing a decent job of getting to all of them. We, I will go for about 55 minutes. Uh, I will stop about 8.55 my time Pacific so that I can get ready to talk to my students at 9 a.m. Uh, in our private uh, Facebook group. If you are one of my students and you have Facebook and you have not yet joined the Facebook group, go ahead and ask to join. Uh, I believe it's called One Rental at a Time Works. Again, we will validate or I will validate you are a student. Uh, and if you are, I will accept you and get you added to the group. Uh, I find that group uh, first and foremost is growing uh, at a nice rate, uh, but it allows us to get deeper and I guess the thing I'm most proud of is students are helping each other, uh, which is, uh, you know, something you always wish happens, uh, but it, uh, until it does, uh, you just don't know. So seeing students interact with other students is awesome. I do my best to interact daily if there's questions. Um, let's call it five days a week. At least I'm in there uh, answering questions. Uh, but Again, students are in there, students are helping each other, and I'm so excited to see that. So again, if you are one of my students, right, you bought the $199 course, How to Start One Rental at a Time, you're doing your homework, you're building your spreadsheets, no, there is a Facebook group with lots of other students have done it. So if you have questions about your spreadsheet, what is the criteria, you know, all of those good things, feel free to join the uh, private group, which is only paying students. So it's a very close-knit group. And uh, you will get help. Uh, that is, again, something I am um, I'm pretty proud to see happening. So, uh, um, you know, again, only for paying students. Uh, people have said it's worth the price of the course. I've kept the course low on purpose because I'm going to sit here on this ledge of financial freedom, I'm not going to increase my lifestyle so uh, I can go ahead and reach down and, and pull as many people up. So that uh, that is going to be fun to do the rest of my life, hopefully 50 years plus. So I will go ahead and first uh, answer a question that came in. I'm pulling it up on my phone. Um, this came from the Right Mindset for Success. Wow, cool, cool name. Uh, but again, remember, put your questions in. Uh, uh, as, as I finish these, I will come back. So just put them in. I will scroll, and uh, we will go at this together. So again, uh, really two questions here, again, from the Right Mindset for Success uh, put on the daily financial news from yesterday. First question is, uh, how do you approach someone who is already successful in real estate for advice? I own a few rentals in Southern California, but not big enough to say I'm an investor yet. Uh, that's part one of his or her question. Uh, a couple of things. First off, uh, if you own uh, any rental properties, whether it be in Southern California Fresno, anywhere across the country, or frankly, anywhere in the world, uh, you are an investor. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like the end of that, right? Um, I'm. Uh, what did it say? I own a few rentals, but I'm not big enough to say I'm an investor yet. Come on. Uh, you are in the, I don't know, one, two, three percent of the population. Uh, you own rental properties, you have a bigger base of foundation. So inflation helps you both in value and in rent. Uh, you've invested in California. Come on, you are you, you are an investor. I want to give you permission to call yourself an investor first. But back to really the meat of your question. I think there's really two rungs of, I guess what I'll call successful investors, again, using your word, not mine. Uh, there are, um, I guess, the big boys. Uh, let's call them, you know, people that have a hundred million dollars or more. They are likely running companies. Uh, they are likely probably running funds or SPACs or REITs or family offices. Like right? the big, big, big boys. 
Um, you know, I don't think there's a way to easily get in contact with them. The, the only way you could do it is pretty much how I used to sell software when I wanted to talk to a senior executive at a Fortune 500 company. You need to find a friend of a friend, right? If you want to talk to the big boys, pretty much the only way you can do it is you need to find someone that you know in your network that knows someone in their network and you need to work the telephones, the conversations to get a personal introduction. This is how I was able to get, meet the, the CIOs and the C executives of the Fortune 50. Um, they don't take emails. You can't work their assistance. You can't door knock. You can't do anything of that nature. But if you go, hey, uh, you know, I know Mary, and Mary is friends with you know, this person's wife, right? If you spend the time making the connections, usually via LinkedIn is what I use, you can over time get in contact with some very, 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 very rich and powerful folks. It takes time. It doesn't always work, but it's the only thing that I have seen work. So let's take that rung out of the equation. And let's talk about a mom and pop investors, which I include myself in, who maybe owns 10 to, I don't know, a couple hundred units. Uh, not really a company, you know, not really one of these big things, probably did it themselves over decades of, of, what not. What I would tell you, the good news is about real estate investing, again, in my opinion, is it's really easy uh, to talk to these folks. Generally, if you've been in the real estate investing business for that long, you already know it's a people business. Uh, you already know, you never know which contact could bring in the next deal, help you raise the next million bucks. Uh, so I have found what I'll call, again, mom and pop investors to differentiate between the big boys is um, they're open, they're pretty open to um, at least an initial conversation via email, phone, or text. They're going to check you out. They're going to validate you because right, they don't want to waste their time. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would reach out. Social media is fine. You know, whatever that, you, you got to realize these people, again, just given the A, just given the gap of, or the range of experience, 20 years plus, um, you know, they're going to be older, obviously, uh, just how it works, right? You can't sign a contract till you're 18. Uh, so, uh, but I would, I would bring them something of value. Um, you know, for example, uh, you're in Southern California. Uh, you're probably going to want to talk to investors in Southern California. I would bring them value. All right. So maybe bring them research about something, maybe bring them uh, some latest stats. Cause you just never know. They may know the data, but they may not. Uh, when people reach out to me all the time, if you come out hot and aggressive pushing for a phone call or something, not going to happen, right? Not going to happen. But if you come out and say, hey, I saw this in Fresno B or, you know, the Washington Journal or whatever, Washington Post, and you, you're, you come with value, you're going to probably get a response. So what I would tell you, if you're looking to get mentored or make contact with a mom and pop investor in your market, Bring value first. Don't come out hot. Um, as this channel grows, as the book sales grows, I probably get five communications a week that just make me feel icky. Uh, they're very aggressive. Uh, like buying my $15 book somehow gives you rights to hours of my time. It's not how it works, even though I'm a giving person. If you come out that way, delete. I, the delete button is very easy to hit. So uh, that's what I have to say for part one of your question. Let me pull up part two. My screensaver kicked in. Second, if someone wanted to invest in your area, what property manager would you recommend in the area around Central Valley? Um, I wish I had a longer list for you. Uh, I don't make any money recommending companies. I don't, I don't put my reputation out. I don't sell my reputation. Uh, I've gone through four or five and fired them. I've had the same one for 10 years. Uh, so the answer is the only, the only connection I have is to the one that I use. Uh, they now are a decent size. When I, there was a time I was their largest owner of units probably six or seven years ago, but they're much bigger now. My little pile is, God, it's, it's not even 2% <coughs> of their entire portfolio. Oh man, it might not even be 1%. Yeah. 
so I, I have contacts to a Regency properties. Um, they are really large. Uh, they're probably not the best answer if you only have one house. Um, but that's who I have. That's who I use. That's who I make contact with. I'm not, I'm freely admitting they may not be the best answer if you only have one house. Uh, but if you're looking to grow, uh, I am personal friends with the founder and owner. Um, uh, he, he and they have done great work for me over the years. Uh, I use them every day. I'm not going anywhere. But again, I don't make any money or I don't, I don't sell my reputation. So, you know, do your homework. Uh, I'm happy to you know, make connections with other people I know. If you want to, if you want to interview others, uh, I would say, I probably, I don't know, twenty maybe thirty people over the last year or so have said, "Hey, who do you use?" I've told them. I would say only half have gone with them. That's okay. Again, I doesn't upset me in the slightest. If you don't get a good vibe, or you don't think they're they're too expensive for you, or whatever it is, uh, it's totally okay. So. Uh, I don't know. Part of me thinks I wish I had a better answer. Like I had a top three, but that's not where I choose to spend my time, <laughs> I guess is my best example. So again, remember this is a live Q and a show. I'm going to take the rest of the questions from the live chat. I will start at the top and go down. So if you ever wanted to ask me a question, uh, this is a place to put it. I'm going to start uh, up at the top with what are your thoughts with the price increase of lumber? and other prime products in relation to existing homes that need rehab and or new construction. Oh, um, yeah, I saw that. I mean, I saw one, one article that said lumber is up 86%. Uh, it just spiked. Uh, so I guess a couple of things. First and foremost, uh, if we see continuous supply disruptions in the supply chain, lumber is going to be expensive. Uh, we are going to see more and more uh, building in the suburbs, uh, in my opinion, which is only going to increase demand on lumber. Uh, so uh, the other thing we must know is sometimes the supply demand imbalance means the builder needs to absorb part of the increase. Not today. Not today. In today's market, the builders will be able to pass on that lumber cost entirely to the new buyer which means prices will go up, which means, yeah. I, again, I see another 12 to 18 months of price increases in the suburbs. Uh, I think that plays for new construction. New construction rises, sort of pulls existing homes up. Uh, this, this supply demand picture is just so out of whack with um, first time home buyers, owner occupants. I've never seen it this way. But the short answer is there's inflation in lumber. The market is set up in a way where that, in, that cost and then some will be entirely passed on to consumers, in my opinion. That's question one. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Gabe, Ultimate Bargains. How you guys? Gabe, uh, do you have any recommendations on hard money lenders that you that like to work with new or fairly new investors? Um, no, I mean, Gabe, again, just sort of like the property management question from before, uh, I am lazy, I guess, and I don't seek out things I don't need. Uh, I haven't needed a hard money lender in nine years, uh, given my ability to raise private money far exceeds my ability to do, do deals. So Gabe, I'm sorry. Uh, I, they're out there. Uh, I can tell you I get postcards from them all the time. Uh, hard money lenders are back to lending. Uh, they understand that flipping is real today. So while hard money lenders went dark in March and maybe early April, they started to loosen up in May. And I would tell you they're back. They're marketing like I've never seen them before. Uh, I get three or four postcards a week from hard money lenders offering me money. But don't forget, it's expensive you know, three points, 11.9%, you know, it's, it's pretty expensive, but, uh, uh, Gabe, I'm sorry. I haven't needed them. And I like the property manager. Don't choose not to waste my time, uh, looking for them. That said, you could probably search on my channel. I've interviewed at least two and maybe not, maybe three hard money lenders. 
So go to my channel, go in the search bar and type in hard money or private money, something like that. I think there's at least three interviews, one in California, one in Vegas. And these are just where they're based. They lend across the country. And I want to say there was a third one. So might do that. Josh, how you doing? Jeffrey, what do we got? Yep. I'm going to check out Uneducated Economist. I, I'm going to check that out. People have re people have recommended him. Gabe, can you explain the loan characteristics on multifamily, 10 units? How long is the loan for? Do you usually have a balloon payment at the end? Is it easy to refinance at the end of the loan? Yeah, so I'll give you my experience, Gabe. Again, um, commercial lenders can make up their own rules. Uh, it is definitely different than residential. Uh, and this goes for five units and above. So everything I'm about to say is my experience. Again, remember my experience is five to 20 units. I've never done a hundred units. I've never gotten um, you know, money from uh, Fannie or Freddie, which some of the big boys have. So just appreciate my answer comes with a skewed or limited experience. So a couple of things that are different right off the bat. Uh, and I can say, actually I'm doing a refinance of a commercial loan right now on a ten, two 10 unit buildings. They were bought separately, but they're side by side. So I'm going to stick them together for a 20 unit refi. So first and foremost, uh, the amortization is not 30 years. It's 25. Uh, I have seen some as low as 20 year amortization and some as high as 30. I would say the majority of them in my experience is 25 year amortization. Second, uh, they have um, fixed periods. And then can either go balloon, as you say in your question, or they go variable. All the ones I have done to date have gone variable at some way or another. Uh, they usually go three, five, seven, or 10 uh, years fixed, and then go variable after. Um, a couple of mine went variable after and rates went down. Uh, so that is uh, very interesting. Um meaning I did a loan, again, a, a personal experience, right? I did a loan. It was for seven years at six and a quarter. It uh, reset uh, about two years ago, and I've been paying four and an eighth since then. Kind of cool, but it resets every year. Um, so that's that. What else? Uh, typically prepays are five, four, three, two, one, meaning 5%. You pay 5% of the loan if you refi it or pay it off in the first year, four in the second year, three, two, one. Loan to value, uh, typically 65% in Fresno. Based on how aggressive or non-aggressive banks are, I've done as high as 70 and as low as 60. Uh, what else And commercial loans? Um, the building is just as important, if not more important than you, the borrower. That's very different than residential. Uh, you fill out an asset statement uh, where in a residential, you just need to show your income most of the time. What else? Oh, leases. They ask for copies of leases. Typically in residential, they don't. Uh, they could ask for a full year of uh, payments. I mean, um, history of payments of the tenants. What else have I seen in 10 year? I think that's what I remember. So if I missed any of your questions. Oh, is it easy to refinance? The last part of your question, Gabe. I would say it depends on the market. It depends on the market. Uh, lending is lending goes through its own cycle. Uh, I'm doing a couple of refis right now, um, probably 30% through them. I would say it's relatively easy, but if I tried to do this refi in March, my guess is it would be pretty hard. Banks have the money, banks make the rules, uh, and you got to watch that. So that's, um, that's what I would do. Oh, question. Uh, have I um, have I received unsolicited offers to buy my income properties? Uh, so I get, uh, Jeffrey, probably just like you, I get plenty of postcards, like dozens a week, offering, saying, I'm buying in the area, or hey, blah, 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 I'd love to buy, call me. But I have yet to receive an official offer. Like, here's the purchase agreement. I offer to buy this property at this price, this earnest money this closing date. Uh, I know there are some situations where those 
investors are doing that. Uh, I have not received one of those. That would be, uh, that would tell you just how hot the market is. When you're writing offers entirely cold, man, <laughs> that tells you how few listings are out there. So yes, I get postcards all the time from wholesalers saying, I want to buy your house, call me, but I have not received a completed unsolicited offer yet, yet, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Carpe Diem, how you doing? Thumbs up. Uh, Adam, I see three one homes that have an additional one one unit on the same lot sometimes. How big a headache is it if if I were to rent out both to two different parties sharing water electricity work? So Adam, uh, I have made I have done this a dozen times, maybe 20 times over the years, and I can only tell you my experience. My experience is it is not worth it. Let's just use real examples. So I rented a three bedroom, one bath house and a one, one, call it apartment, call it mother-in-law unit, whatever, uh, several different times. I might get 1100 for the house and I might get seven or 800 for the other one. So my rent collections, call it two grand, which is great, right? Two grand seems awesome. But then you realize that somebody has to pay the electricity, water, garbage, and you can even put it in the lease. Hey, the back unit is 35% of the square footage. So they owe 35%. The front owes 65. But the bill will be sent to one person. So let's say you send it to the front unit. They get all pissed off because they only owe 65%. And then they try to collect from the back. Doesn't work. Reverse doesn't work. So what ultimately will happen is you, the landlord, will pay the bill and then you will bill back tenants for their usage. And let's just say the collection on that is not worth it. Fights start a lot. Uh, I invest in Fresno where it gets really hot in the summer. And I cannot tell you how many times it just doesn't get paid because the front unit yells at the back unit and the back unit yells at the front unit and bad shit happens. I will never, ever, 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 ever rent uh, a configuration like a 3111 with one meter to two different families or two different people. It's not going to happen. However, however, there is actually a huge unserved market for multi generational living. That market is very profitable. Um, so don't fight it, don't cause headaches. So in my earlier example, you're getting two grand, but you're probably losing 400 ultimately in utilities. So it's like 1600 and your management headache is higher and all these other nasty things. You can rent to multi-generational, which means, you know, maybe daughter and son or daughter and son-in-law and kids are in the one unit, but grandma's in the back or vice versa. Mom and their new kids are in the front, but their teenage kids in the back. There's a huge business for that. And the beauty of doing it on that is it's one lease, one owner, and you push all of the energy and utilities expense to that one lease. So that's what I do every time. I still buy these a lot, but I will never, ever rent that kind of configuration to two separate people. Not worth the headache. Yes, you can make it work if you're willing to deal with headaches. I'm lazy at this point. Not going to happen. So hopefully that makes sense. Remember, you guys, I'm here for your questions. Uh, so if you have questions you've always wanted to ask, ask them. Uh, I will go until there's no questions or we've consumed 55 minutes. For your tenant-occupied homes for landlords. Uh, I assume you're talking about the pride of ownership. I just put them on my channel. I don't... Uh, I, when I get them, I put them out there and people tell me they want to buy them. They sell really quick. I'm not doing as many because prices are so high today. So uh, I just sold three. We got, we, the last three I had just went in contract. What is today? I think it went in contract Thursday. Somebody's buying all three. Um, but yeah, I'll just talk about them online. I'll, I'm, I don't hide anything. I post my videos the day they happen. 
So um, just watch the channel and, and look, and I'll, I will clearly say, hey, bought another one. This is what I'm thinking. Here it comes. And usually they're sold in 24 or 48 hours. I don't know what else to do. I, I want to be fair. Seems fair to me. Adam, you're very welcome. Congrats. Thanks. Carpe diem. What is your projection of the peak of the housing market before it starts to decline? Well, let's be clear. This is a kind of a loaded question. Uh, so we're going to talk residential. We're going to talk single family. We are going to talk suburbs. Uh, let's 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 put this. So not suburbs. Let's talk national. Uh, how do you answer this question? Well, let's break it down. I don't know how to. Do, you can't really do it in mass. So I think the urban cities. Again, let's talk, those are easier, right? New York, San Francisco, L.A., Seattle, Chicago. You, you guys know what they are. Uh, they are likely going to see their peak prices. If they haven't already seen them in August, they will see them by October. Uh, they are certainly going to start going down by the end of the year, my opinion. But that's five, maybe 10%. Now, if we're talking about the suburbs like Fresno, for example, like all the other suburbs or suburbs around the country, um, I think most of them got a long way to go. I think if you could tell me, Carpe Diem, when interest rates go up, I could answer this question. If you've read my book, you know I'm a firm believer in the affordability index. Affordability index is made up of three variables. Price, interest rate, wages. As the math looks today in most suburb markets, they could go up 30 to 50% before they're unaffordable. And markets don't generally go up that fast in a short period of time. So it could be years. Just again, because I only know one market in detail. For example, in Fresno, I will look to sell stuff if it ever gets below a, a number of 20. Right now, I just checked on Monday of this week, it's at 50. Prices could go up almost 200 grand assuming interest rates stay where they are, which is an absolute assumption, before they're unaffordable. So houses get unaffordable based on price and interest rate. I believe the greatest shock to real estate is if interest rates double. So if they go from 3 to 6%, crash. I don't know. I don't necessarily... In your question, it seems to, see, it seems to be leading... To an answer of, I think they're going to fall. I don't think they're going to fall. I think the big cities are in trouble. I think tourist markets like, like Las Vegas are definitely in trouble. But I think those are it's going to be spotty markets. I think most of the country is going to be okay in 2020. I think 2021 will be up 10%, double digits. I really do. You know, I think 2022 could be an okay year. I just... People buy on mortgage payments and until they're unaffordable, which means it goes, you know, goes under 20, which means one in five people can afford to buy it. I just don't see stress. I don't see a wave of inventory, right? I did a video on the four things that cause price destruction and I just don't see them. I don't see any of the four. Now, of course, number four is something that can come out of left field and that is government regulation or tax changes. If that happens, just like it did in the SLL crisis, that, that could whack it, but I don't see it. I don't see it. So not for a couple of years, at least, in my opinion. Uh, Jeffrey, Ultimate Bargains. There are owner-occupied high-end homes near me that have a rental carriage home. Yep, in the back to supplement owner's income. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, if you're living there, that's going to be a big thing in California. They just approved, and unfortunately, this health crisis has caused it to slow down. But you now can build an ADU, accessory dwelling unit. It was looked at as one of the answers to affordable houses in the Bay Area, affordable housing crisis in the Bay Area, right? You can build an ADU in the Bay for 70 to 100 grand, depending. Um, so it was going to be common, but of course, the health crisis has kind of whacked all of that. But yes, very common for to have a carriage house or mother-in-law house in the back. How well does a three, one and a half home rent compared to a three, two, and which one's more profitable generally? Dumb question. No, no dumb questions. Again, every market's different. Uh, I would tell you a half bath means a lot. Like a three, one and a half will rent a lot faster than a three, one. Um, 
I don't know, again, my market only that a three, two, a full second bath makes that much of a difference. It could, it, it, for me, it's an extra 50 bucks, right? I asked for an extra 50 bucks in that full bath. Uh, but houses are renting so fast today. Um, yeah, that extra half bath doesn't mean anything. And this, and again, this, this, I really think mom and pop landlords could be in trouble next year. So we could see a lot of frustrated landlords sell. Um, a lot, the affordable housing problem is not going away. Uh, so I don't know what is it, how, how well. They both rent extremely well. That extra half bath means makes a difference, at least in my market, Kenny. And again, the extra full bath gets me an extra 50 bucks, which I like. My dog's making noise. Hey, Jimbo. Carpe diem, you're welcome. Thumbs up. Larry. Uh, hi, Michael. How are your assets structured for protection? I don't answer those questions, Larry, because entity protection and all of that is a personal choice. I don't know your situation. I don't know your income. I don't know all your assets. It's just inappropriate for me to answer that question. Um, so I can just say they are protected, multiple entities, all of that. I don't answer accounting or legal questions because I am not an attorney, nor am I a, a certified accountant. Yep, Wayne, transparency, you got it. It's the only way I know how to go. Gabe, which are the best research websites where you can find the cities that people are moving to due to COVID? Uh, Gabe, there's actually one old one that I would go to is U-Haul. And what do I mean by that? Go to U-Haul and type in LA to Vegas and then type in Vegas to LA. U-Haul rates, last time I checked from LA to Vegas is like a thousand bucks, but Vegas to LA is like a hundred bucks. You can look at things like that. And again, Gabe, just like the property management question, just like the hard money question, I don't spend time researching other cities. It's not fun for me. It's not what I enjoy doing. I invest in one market. I know one market. That's where I'm at. But that U-Haul stat is uh, pretty interesting. I would look at that. Because again, it's really easy, right? If you want to know where people are going from New York, go New York to Miami. New York to uh, you know Virginia Beach, New York to whatever, and then do the reverse. And if you can see a differentiation in price, that tells you all you need to know. Carpe diem, you're very welcome. I don't know if it's the answer you expected or an answer you like, but hey, it's one guy's silly opinion on a Saturday morning. <laughs> uh, Theo, uh-oh, what did I miss? Why did you say mom and pop landlords will struggle next year? Well, again, Theo, what I'm talking about there is the CDC rent moratorium. I believe there's a lot of mom and pop landlords that once we get to the other side of this are going to go, you know what? Owning rentals when I'm 75 years old is not something I want to do. I'm going to kick my tenants out. I'm going to clean up the property and I'm going to sell it to owner occupants. So what I mean by that is mom and pop landlords are having a horrible year. It is stressful. I believe owning rental properties in 2021, especially of the affordable size, is going to be very profitable because what's going to happen? Let's just use numbers. Let's say there's a million rental homes owned by mom and pops. My guess is this crazy eviction moratorium, this landlords are evil, this all this other freaking nonsense, which is unfortunate and not true, means that million is going to go to 800,000. 750,000, whatever, it's going to be smaller. And that means that um, tenants are going to lose long term. And that means owners of affordable units next year will see values increase and rents increase. But, but again, remember, this comes from a point of pain. 2020 has been an awful year on lots of fronts. And this last CDC kick in the teeth is really going to hurt some mom and pop landlords. And my guess is many of them are going to say it's just not worth it. But if, you're, if your time frame is longer than right now, which mine is, it's all goodness for us. But don't be confused. A lot of your sisters and brothers, your mom and pop landlords are, are really hurting today. And it's, it's really unfortunate, in my opinion. Wayne, in your book, you said you were going to get your real estate license. Did you ever do that? Yes, I did. I got my real estate license, 
I think October of 2018. Um, and I will not be renewing it. I hate paperwork. I have no interest in representing other people. I want to simplify my life. Uh, I've actually made 30 grand, but it's all from selling my own stuff. And I actually don't do any of the paperwork. I split commissions with other people. Um, but it's just not worth it to me. I don't want to do the continuing education. I don't want to represent people. I just, I am trying to enjoy the rest of my life and paperwork is not part of what I want. So yes, I got my license. I passed the first time. Yay. I will never do that again. Yeah. Uh, Gavin Newsom is U-Haul's leading salesman. <laughs> oh, carpe diem. That's a good one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No question. Uh, man, California exit is real. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, that made me laugh. Good one. <laughs> Kenny, thanks. You're very welcome. Oh, Jeffrey question. When it comes time to sell, yep. Will you offer the property to your tenants before listing on the MLS? Uh, yeah, I will, of course, have that conversation. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I did that last time. Uh, when I did the 1031 exchanges in 06, I think only one, I think one of my tenants bought it. Full price, right? Didn't give him any discounts. I might have given him a thousand bucks or something. I might have actually, you know what? I think I gave him two thousand bucks off because I wouldn't have to do a cleaning. Yeah, I, I will do that, of course. Yeah, if there if the if the existing tenant's willing to pay when I'm willing to ask, of course. I think you should always do that. Uh, I I absolutely will because again, what what what's the expense for me? Well, okay, well I can give them a sixty day notice. Then they have to vacate. Then I have to clean. It basically delays my listing by at least 90 days. So yes, I will. And I recommend you let your tenants know, hey, I'm thinking about selling it. Have you had any interest? <coughs> and you'll never know. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they'll say yes. Carpe diem, are you avoiding purchase of homes in the foothills prone to fire areas? Um, not on purpose, but yes, I own nothing outside the city. Um, because again, I want to be... I don't actually, I don't want land, right? For my rental units, I do not want land. Land land just opens me up for all kinds of stuff, cleaning and it's just, yeah. I don't buy acreage, right? You get, you get a four bedroom, two bath on a two acre house. I'm not your guy. I want a basic cookie cutter, maybe between 4,000 and 10,000 square foot lots. I don't want land, but it wasn't because of fire. It's because I don't want the freaking code enforcement and all these other people in my shit about tall weeds and other things. So I avoid buying in the foothills, but not because of fire, uh, but because I don't want nonsense government bureaucrats giving me headaches. Wayne, you're, yeah, mom and pop will sell the goose that's laying the golden egg, but if they get one huge egg, that they can eat the rest of their life, no problem for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you got to expect it. I mean, there are some people that have been landlords for 30, 40, 50 years. Home, homes are free and clear. Man, just sell it, move on. And frankly, what they should do is sell it owner or owner finance. That way they don't get the tax hit. But yes. <coughs> yeah. There you again, someday we're all sell, right? Or or we'll die. But selling's not always a bad answer. Andrew just looked up U-Haul rates, Vegas to San Francisco, 332, San Francisco to Vegas, 1166. Told you. Uh, see this data on aggregate level nationally. Uh, I bet you U-Haul will give it to you, but I bet you they'll make you pay for it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know of a way to get that in mass, that data, Andrew, in mass. But yeah, that's, if you ever want to check who's going where, go to U-Haul. It was something I learned a decade ago. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you think San Francisco to Vegas is interesting, do LA to Vegas. I bet you it's even different. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think Vegas to LA was like under $200. It was crazy. Josh, uh, is it common for property management companies to have terms beyond eight and 10% like they get listing if they decide to sell? Um, I don't know, define common. Uh, I've definitely seen that. 
in management agreements, I would never agree to that. I would cross it out. I would strike it. Um, I've seen other things, you know, besides eight to 10%, they get half the deposit or half first month rent or whatever. Property management is not a, um, it, it is left to, it's a negotiation. It's, it's a conversation between you and the, the owner, you and that, that contact. So yeah, I guess I would say just like all leases or all contracts, they're going to put in everything they think they can, but it's a negotiation. So cross out. Yep. That's what I would do. So I, common, right? Is it more than 50%? I don't know. Is it 30%? Probably. Probably. Hi, Philippe. On the homes that you sold to tenants. Yep. Did you, did you, will you do owner financing? If not, why not? Well, I didn't because I was doing a 1031 exchange, Philippe, and I needed that equity. So at the time, I was in a situation where I needed to move the equity from property A to the property B via like kind exchange. So owner financing was not a great option for me. So yeah, I didn't do that. But would I do that in the future? Yeah, if I'm 75, 80 years old, yeah, you bet your ass I'll, I'll probably sell all of my stuff on owner financing. Well, not all of it, most of it on owner financing. So it's just your stage in life. Uh, it did not make sense for me in 2006, seven, eight. Uh, when I was a realtor, I sent out postcards only to waterfront land only owners. Yeah, there you go. And I had hundreds of listings and never sold one. Ouch. But other realtors did for me. Ah, oh, look at you. Very creative. Yep. Yeah, I think there's riches and niches. It's a, it's a phrase I heard the other day, which I really liked. It's not mine actually don't know where I heard it, somewhere on YouTube, riches in niches. So just like that, if you want to get really known for something, send to a targeted list, right? Waterfront, water, waterfront land can't be a big list. And it's very niched and you can do a very targeted thing. So yeah, riches in niches. So um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Carpe diem. I'm lazy, dude. Not going to happen. But yeah, I see your point. Lots of, again, I am uh, I am lucky to be in a situation where I can let laziness uh, dwarf my need for 30 grand. I admit I'm spoiled. Uh, yep, all about listings. Yep. Uh, is your question, is your property manager also the listing agent when you decide to sell? Um, I have let them sell some for me. Uh, I, and then I, I, I don't know. I go with the agents that help me or I, that know the area. Uh, so no, I do not default to them. Uh, I've had them sell some stuff for me for sure. Uh, but again, you have to realize I'm now personal and family friends with the owner. So it's kind of a special relationship. Um, so I don't pretend to think that, that my activity with my property manager is normal uh, landlord property manager relationship. So I, I don't pretend that to be the same for many. Uh, do you recommend reverse 1031 exchanges? Uh, Gabe, I can only recommend or talk about things I've done. I've never done a reverse 1031 exchange. I've certainly read about them. Uh, they certainly make logical sense to me. Uh, they seem hard and intricate. So, but I've never done one. So I have no personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. Riches and niches quite common. Ah, of course it is. No new ideas in this world. <laughs> I just never heard it. Or maybe I heard it and it didn't hit me until that episode. I have no idea. Uh, do you currently have any other market you are investing in other than Fresno? Don't you have any interest in out of state? Uh, Kenny, no, I have zero interest in out of state. Uh, I believe at least my experience with out of state investing or investors are people do it because it's cheap. I've known very, I've known lots of people get hurt by cheap. I, uh, I believe you need to spend a lot of time in your market. I believe you need to learn your market. I believe it is, you need to invest time driving around. And, um, 
I believe there's a lot of people profiting on selling the ease and cheapness out of state. I do not believe it is nearly as easy. Yes, it absolutely can work. Don't hear me wrong. But I have talked to now hundreds of people doing out-of-state investing, and 70% of them have horror stories. 70 It ain't 50-50. It is 70-30. So no, I am not a huge fan of out-of-state investing. I, I live in... Mountain View, California, which is one of the most expensive and ridiculous markets. I pulled out a California map and found something two and a half hours away that made sense. That's good enough for me. And oh, by the way, I was willing to go there three, four times a month for a decade. No, I, I have no interest. Uh, as I've been very clear and right about, I looked at other markets in 06, 07, 08. Uh, but no, I have no interest out of state. I believe the people that sell out of state investing on the on based on a spreadsheet are um, for the most part fooling themselves. Uh, if now let's flip the script. If you have somebody, the whole key to out of state investing is honest boots on the ground. If you have someone that you are not paying that will show up at your funeral. In that market, maybe you grew up there, maybe your brother, your sister, uh, your first cousin lives there, and they will do sporadic drive-bys and tell you the honest truth, even if it's bad. It could make sense. Absolutely can make sense. Um, I believe most people don't have that. Most people rely on people that they are paying. And here's the deal. I Even in Fresno, I had I fired five property managers because they lied to me. They told me good news. They told me half truths. I can't tell you, three of the five managers were fired because of the following. One week and I told them I was coming. Properties looked great. I went back the next weekend and they did not look good. You can't do that very easy out of state. It is your money. You Nobody cares like the owner. And I promise you, out-of-state investing is not easy, nor it is as lucrative as spreadsheets make it sound. Sorry, I don't have. And then lastly, I stay in Fresno because I'm not going to build another team. The hardest thing about doing out-of-state or out-of-area is the team, the boots on the ground. Uh, and again, just like a couple of answers today, I'm lazy. I have no interest in going anywhere else. Question, have you reached out to interview Ken McElroy or Robert Kiyosaki? I have reached out to Ken McElroy. I did a I did a review of one of his videos and I sent it to him. I thought it was a fairly positive interview. Uh, he did not reply back. He's, he's big time. Uh, so if you guys want to do me a favor, go to Ken McElroy's page and suggest he, uh, he be interviewed on one rental at a time channel. That would be very nice. As for Robert Kiyosaki, no, I haven't reached out. He's kind of, uh, he's kind of extreme. These days, um, he also slants. I would much rather interview Ken McElroy than Robert Kiyosaki. Don't get me wrong. If, if I had a chance to interview Robert, I would. But I don't see myself actively reaching out to Robert, uh, even though he changed my life. I've been very clear. His book changed my life. I would love to interview Ken. I think Ken's a good guy. I think he is um, generally motivated to help. Um, I think Robert loves selling books and his game, my opinion. Uh, am I, REI, are you, Larry, are you referring to like meetups, REI meetups and all of that? Yeah, I'm, act, I'm as active as I can be in my local market. And I have been for at least 15 years. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think being part of your real estate meetups, getting on the mailing list, communicating, uh, doing all of that is absolutely imperative. You never, again, I've said this a hundred times. It's not about who you know in your market. It's who knows you and what you're looking for. And the best way to do that is go to real estate meetups, network, ask questions, tell them what you're looking for. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. 
Uh, okay, what's next? FYI, virtual wholesaling or investing is difficult to find reliable boots on the ground. Yes, totally right. Yes, I agree. Carpe diem, ever think about selling your California properties and moving to Florida where your purchase power is tripled? No. Uh, no is the short answer. The long answer is I'm not necessarily tied to California. However, my wife is not going anywhere. And I believe in the very simple, happy life, ha happy wife, happy life. And like I've said six times now, I'm pretty lazy. It already kind of works. I do. There's part of me that thinks in the next decade we'll leave California because I could start to see cracks with Olivia, but um, not yet. But yeah, I'm not. I've been here 50 years in California. I'd, I'd leave in a heartbeat. My idea of a perfect life would be to have three condos in different parts of the world. One in Asia, one in probably South America, and then one in the US somewhere. And we would just travel to our different condos every 90 days. That would be the idea for me. But that's not her idea. And, and my idea loses to her idea. All right, so we'll get a couple more questions because I have three minutes. Uh, currently, most financial institutions will not give HELOC against the primary residence. What financial institutions right now? Uh, I don't have any answers to that. Uh, I don't, again, I only can tell you what I look for and I haven't looked for a HELOC in a long time. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, a gut estimate, how far down do you think San Francisco will drop? Um, this is of course housing. Uh, it'll be duration based, but I could see 15% by the summer of next year. Yep. Yep. Yeah, here we go. So that's what I got for you today. Again, do me a favor, hit the thumbs up. Re I really like that Ken McElroy idea that just came out of the blue. If you guys don't, if you all can do me a favor, right? There's 40 people watching this. There'll hopefully be five or 600 people that watch this over the next week. If even half of you went to Ken McElroy's page and said, hey, just on one of his videos, hey, have you ever ha interviewed one rental at a time? Something like that. Uh, maybe Ken and I would do, um, could do an interview together and that would be a lot of fun. So take care, everyone. If you're one of my students, I will see you in the Facebook group in about seven minutes. Bye-bye.